KTN Prime. Any revelation of the identity of a witness whose identity has been protected by this court amounts to an offence in this court. Protecting witnesses, ICC judges issue stern warning of a leakage of witness identity. Missing beneficiaries, forest evictees cry foul over resettlement fund. The water calling, Turkana families on the move to discovered water source. Maisha yao ni mazuri, vile wasema vwa. Wasema wenye wa kikupendo utapata life mzuri, lakini wa kikuchukia, na fazali wenge kwenye shimo sayi. And romance tourism, effects of the culture of beach boys on perspective tonight. This is KTN Prime with Yvonne Okwara and Wilson Buru. Good evening to you and welcome to the most comprehensive bulletin in the country. This is KTN Prime. Indeed, and very many thanks for joining us this evening. And as we have over the past couple of days, we start our bulletin tonight at The Hague. Here's Rita Tinina with the latest update of our coverage of The Hague Trial. Good evening from The Hague, where for several hours earlier on in the day, attention shifted from witness testimony to witness protection following discussions on Kenyan social media on the supposed identity of witness number 536. The developments in Kenya attracted a serious warning from the trial chamber over the revelation or attempted revelation of witness identity. Please be seated. Veuillez vous asseoir. Just as soon as the morning session in the trial against Deputy President William Ruto and Joshua Arab Sang got underway. Prosecutor, I understand there is something you want to raise in closed session. Trial Chamber 5A went into a closed session and instead of resuming in open court at around 11 a.m., a meeting of the parties in the case was convened, apparently over concerns on the supposed leakage of the identity of witness number 536 in social media in Kenya. When the chamber reconvened in the afternoon, presiding judge Chile Eboe Osuji kicked off the session with what he termed as a special reminder. Any revelation of the identity of a witness whose identity has been protected by this court amounts to an offense in this court. The chamber, seemingly not amused by reports of the supposed leakage of witness identity, which the court says is a crime. Such conducts will be investigated and the culprits will be prosecuted. The court has now issued a warning to, among others, members of the press. Members of the press, bloggers, social media members or participants, and their web hosts are particularly called upon to desist from doing anything that would reveal or attempt to reveal the identity of protected witnesses. With witness protection concerns having overtaken the day's agenda, witness 536 did not continue with her testimony. As the chamber dealt with witness identity concerns, but deliver us from evil, for that is the kingdom. Members of parliament who are in The Hague in support of Deputy President William Ruto had a free morning. And they too have concerns. We want this thing to move, as required. What they term as frequent private sessions by the chamber. 
The MPs raised their concerns with the ICC registrar. Hey, I do understand that you're frustrated about this. The ICC did not make any promises, insisting private or closed sessions are part of normal court procedures. I'm afraid I have to say that it will happen on a regular basis. Tomorrow, the proceedings in trial chamber 5A will kick off half an hour late. No reason was given and it still remains unclear whether witness 536 will continue with her testimony testimony tomorrow morning. We are keeping an eye on things for you from this end as we wait to see what direction the proceedings will take come tomorrow. From The Hague, I am Rita Tinina. Now on our BQ tonight, we ask, do you agree with the ICC prosecution that the trial be conducted in private? Do you agree with the ICC prosecution that the trial be conducted in private? And you can get in touch with us on our SMS number, which is 22155. That number again is 22155. Please start your SMS with a yes or no, followed by a brief comment. And please do remember to send us your name and where you are writing us from. And of course, you can also get in touch with us on Twitter. That's at KT in Kenya at Yvonne Okwara and at Wilson underscore Mburu. We look forward to your comments tonight. Now a young woman has come out to clarify that she is not the ICC's first witness after her picture was circulated on social media yesterday. Rehab Mudoni Kagiri is a resident of Burnt Forest and claims the photograph was lifted from her Facebook page. She now wants the matter investigated. KTN's Wilkis Tanyabwa reports. This picture first appeared on social media on Tuesday afternoon, the very same day the first prosecution witness in the case against Deputy President William Ruto and former radio presenter Joshua Arab Sung gave her testimony at the International Criminal Court. While the identity of the first witness was concealed at the court, back at home, Kenyan circulated this picture, claiming that this was she. A rumor that eventually came to the attention of 27-year-old Rehab Mudoni Kagiri, the woman in this photo. She turned up at the police station in Eldoret to record a statement over what she says is a case of mistaken identity. Rahab, a businesswoman based in Burn Forest, says she asked a friend to take the now infamous photo. I wanted to send that picture to my profile in my Facebook account because there is no profile picture. Once uploaded, the photograph set off a chain of events. After about two hours, a friend of mine just called me and told me, Rahab, are you serious? I saw your picture in Facebook at Iwanasema at your one of the witnesses. The boy just asked me, where are you? Ni kamambia kwenye nafanya kazi, akakujo mpaka kapao. Haka nionyesha the picture. I was shocked. I didn't know that it's something serious. Until Johnny, mpaka watu ndo wakanza kunipigia simu. Friends from all over the country, my family members, wakanza kunipigia simu at Iwanasema. We just saw your photo at Iwanasema, you are one of the witnesses. Ni kamambia na oo. And before she knew it, Rahab was making news. I just slept well because I'm just innocent. This now prompting Rahab to head to the police station in Eldoret, where she recorded a statement stating that though this was indeed her picture making the rounds on the internet, the name beneath it was not hers. Neither was she an ICC witness. To be frank, I don't know anything about the ICC cases. But I'm one of the vict I'm a victim. I was affected. I'm one of the IDPs. We have received that report of Rahab Budoni Kagiri, and um, uh, I have just uh, sent her to the relevant office, where that matter can also be referred to the uh, cyber crime for the purposes of clarity. This coming as the ICC retreated to deliberate on just how to ensure the protection of prosecution witnesses a day after it emerged that the name of the first witness may have been leaked on social media. Rahab later took down all the photos on her Facebook page. This perhaps a cautionary tale as to just where images posted on social media can end up. Wilkes Anyabwa, KTN. Now let's stay with matters ICC and the prosecution has expressed concern over attempts by the Kenyan parliament to withdraw from the Rome Statute. And while it has been said that this move will not affect the Kenyan cases currently at the ICC, it appears that there may be some effect after all, as Samogina now reports. 
Thank you very much, court officer. The prosecution wants a discreet trial of Deputy President William Ruto and Joshua Sang. They are as bad as you. They think like you. They are... The office of the prosecutor put parliament on the spot at the ICC, claiming its resolution to withdraw the country from the Rome Statute is psychologically intimidating its witnesses. This forms part of a larger culture of intimidation, which is being fostered not only by certain quarters of Kenyan society, but also now it seems has reached the highest echelons of Kenyan authorities. The parliamentary answered proving that the motion was approved both in the National Assembly and the Senate were produced in court. The prosecution claims witness attrition has increased, but Ruto's defense rebuffed the claims as diversionary tactics to conceal what they claim as a shoddy prosecution case. One of them indicated a concern that if Kenya did in fact go through and if this law was passed, that he would be living in a pariah state in which international law did not apply and he would therefore have no protection. A, a complete 180 degree turn needs to be had away from the presumption of openness towards a presumption of secrecy which is singularly without merit and actually has a, a massive capacity to cause serious and irredeemable prejudice to the defense. Setting exposure of its witness identities by individuals and bloggers in Kenya, the prosecution says Parliament's move compounds the risk. They want the trials to be held in secrecy. Exposure of the identity of witnesses and the developments in the Kenyan Parliament. These are matters that affect all witnesses residing in Kenya. Many of the prosecution witnesses are already uh, outside of Kenya. Ocampo said that even prior to confirmation. He said, I've got no witnesses in Kenya. So what could the possible danger be? The prosecution charged that Kenya's commitment to the ICC is on trial. This prompted a swift defense by the deputy president, who is himself a suspect undergoing the trial at the ICC. It remains to be seen the extent to which that cooperation is actually provided. Uh, and uh, we have reason to believe that in the near future that cooperation will be tested. The fact that I am here and the fact that a democratically elected deputy president of the Republic of Kenya is here is a confirmation that Kenya Belong, believes in the rule of law and belongs to the community of nations that are civilized. The adversarial stance between the defense and the prosecution went a notch higher. In the present circumstances, we submit that the chamber, chamber should lean in favor of granting in court protective measures for all witnesses. We say amounts to a license to lie because those witnesses are concerned of two things in my respectful submission. One is They'll be found out and prosecuted. The ICC judges will decide whether Parliament's resolution will influence the decision to conduct the trial in private sessions to protect the identities of all critical prosecution witnesses. Samogina Ketian. From The Hague, let's come back to the country where hundreds of displaced persons in Narok and El Geo Marakwet now claim that their names were excluded from the list of beneficiaries. The IDPs are demanding their share of the 400,000 shillings set to be issued to each family for resettlement. Hundreds of families turned up at Emboboot and Caviego to claim their names are missing from the list of beneficiaries of the 400,000 shillings following forest evictions. This has prompted the local leadership and the Ministry of Special Programs to set up a 10-man task force to review the list. The Marquet East MP has asked the government to issue title deeds in Marquet East and West constituencies, saying no single title deed has been issued in the entire Marquet region. 
On the other hand, Elgeo Marquette Senator Kipchumba Markomen has called for the review of the resettlement list. He asked the government to also consider the cases of families who lost their identity cards when Kenya Forest Service torched their house in forceful eviction. Na kesho kama tumeenda kwa lesiambe na serikali watubee hiyo title deed, ndio tuweze hata kuenda kuomba loan na tukue kama wa Kenya wengine. But the government insisted that after the resettlement allocation of 1.19 billion shillings, no person will be allowed to move back into the forest. Wakati yikuwa 24,000, imesaidia kuokoa Aror, imeokoa Tinu uko Kerio, imeokoa mpaka Turkana Samburu, imeokoa mpaka Egypt, imeokoa mpaka Lake Victoria. Hundreds of people in Naro County camped outside the district offices, claiming their names were also missing from the list of those expected to benefit from the government's compensation. Tiokuwa kwa nyakambi, tulioti ita sheria serikali, tukambiwa musionyesha aibu, kaeni manyumbani, tutawatetea, tutawafanyia hili na lile. Mbona leo hisi tunataa kusauliwa? There are only three days left for the completion of the IDP's resettlement across the country. Charity Kimani, Katie and Prime. Now, when oil was discovered in Turkana County, Kenya erupted in pride and joy at what was anticipated to boost the national economy. But for Turkana residents, the true blessing has come in the discovery of a massive water reservoir. KTN's Masi Kandir was in Lotikipi and brings us a story of a long wait to quench the Turkana thirst. <laughs> The recent discovery of natural resources in Turkana seems to be the answered prayer to this popular song by Turkana artist Sami Epungure. Turkana can now raise its head, its dry ground sits on Africa's black gold, oil, and more recently, a treasure close to the hearts of many Turkana residents. Water, life is now in Turkana, they say. Lakini mungu amekumbuka sisi, tokiwa mwisho hii mapu ya Kenya, ya kuwa kumbe sisi hapa, tunayesa kupata maji. Na walisema tena kuna kumbe. Word went round fast, and in line with the nomadic culture, many moved to be closer to the treasure. 200 billion cubic meters of fresh water discovered along the Lotikipi plains. And now, Shukuru, Wafadeli, Wa UNESCO, when you will find when you will identify image through satellite. Before you get to Lotikipi, though, the road to Turkana is characterized by this. Children desperately begging for water. The little we had, we decided to share. Every sip is fought for, a sip that may quench the thirst, but not for long. Poor infrastructure and poverty are not the only issues that have rocked the largest county in the country. Insecurity has been a concern in Turkana. Lotikipi Plains borders South Sudan. Raids by the Toposa bandits are a common occurrence here. Security was therefore paramount as we travelled to the water spot, an hour's drive from Lokichogyo town. Lotikipi loosely translates to the land of many waters. As we arrive, we expected to see residents enjoying water. But like a mirage, is what the recent discovery is to the residents. Mm -hmm. The point at which water was drilled and discovered here about a month ago is sealed, waiting for the government's move to connect pipes for distribution. And just as we arrive, children run towards us. They think it's the water company here to unlock the treasure. After playing around the water source for a while, they are told we are not from the water company. They leave. 
disappointed. Mzelo Repisho tells me he moved here with his family to benefit, but since its discovery, nothing much has changed. His patience is running out. Lakini ikiisha na bila kabla hii jakuwa tayari, hawa ni watu wakondoka hapa, wezi wangoje wakufia hapa kwa hii wanje na hawoni matumaini ya hii kisima vile ilishimbwa. Wataeda kutafuta maji malipengene. The dry season slowly sets in. Many travel as far as 12 kilometers to the dry waterbeds. The scorching sun will not wait. The water in the streams have dried out, and so the digging starts to get the water that has sunk down. Every day it feds. Though it may look dirty, these water holes are the points of quenching thirst, yet a few kilometers lies the clean treasure. And reachable, the animals here have learned to dig too in search for this precious commodity. Erot Leuren Awido is helped by her grandchildren, too fragile, too old, to fetch water for her livestock, that which she says will not only feed her grandchildren but take them to school. It is the dry season. It needs double effort to dig for water. After getting enough for the gods, the children will have to dig for more for their own use. Ningependa serikali iweze kuja kwa act kwa haraka sana. The grounds where the water was flushed for demonstration about two weeks ago is the evidence of what was the green grass thriving as a result, a reminder to the residents that they too can benefit only after the completion of the piping system. What the government said will take a month, one long to wait for many here. The last verse to the song saying, Turkana is tired of being viewed as a food aid dependent. Well, as the song ends, the face of Turkana is changing, its troubles slowly ending, the potential to do much more, achieve more. The discovery of water here in Turkana couldn't have come at a better time with temperatures here rising as high as 37 degrees Celsius. For the residents who've been sitting on this treasure for a long time, they say they want their discovered treasure as soon as now. Masi Kandie Katien, Lotikipi, Turkana West. Now from Turkana, we're going to take a short break, but before we do that, let's remind you of our BQ tonight and we ask, do you agree with the ICC prosecution that the trial be conducted in private? Do you agree with the ICC prosecution that the trial be conducted in private? And you have various ways to get in touch with us. SMS number is 22155, begin with a yes or no, and a brief comment. You can also get in touch with us on Twitter, that's at KTN Kenya at Yvonne Okwara and at Wilson underscore Buru. Here's to Polika Pateto says, yes, justice may not be found if the Kenyans are watching. Witnesses will be killed. Devi, you say, no, no, I disagree. If there's nothing to hide, why deny the public the chance to know the truth? All of these comments and much more as we continue with our news broadcast. We take a short break now. Here's what's coming up next. On Perspective Tonight, romance and tourism in Lamu, sometimes at the expense of the coastal youth. expenses, <laughs> You're watching KTN Prime. Many thanks for staying with us on KTN Prime. Here we are back again with more news for you. Well, the authorities of a school whose students were captured on video carrying logs of wood at night have explained that the incident is an environmental club activity. The management of the school in Chogoria says the students were not being subjected to corporal punishment. KTN's Carol Derry reports. 
Video footage availed to KTN show boys carrying logs of wood. Upon inquiry, the boys identified themselves as students of Santa Ritz School in Chogoria, Terakanithi County. What stroked the cameraman's curiosity was why the boys, some in school at Aya, were carrying heavy logs at night. The boys are hard complaining about the activity and encouraging the cameraman who took these pictures to speak out on their behalf. So we drove to the Santa Ritz School in Chogoria. The school headmistress Dolly Kenya explained that she was new in the school and therefore not in a position to comment on the matter. I'm, I'm not aware because I came yesterday. She directed us to the director of the school who was not in when we visited the premises. We got the director's number from this board and sought his comments in a telephone interview. Though acknowledging that the students were indeed carrying the said logs as seen in the video, Charles Modamia, the director, insisted that the students seen carrying the logs were members of the environmental club. Eh, na kubeba kuni uko shambani ovi ovi, ata usiku. Kama hiyo siku walitoka hapa sane wakibeba hizo kuni. And carrying of logs to be used as firewood was an exercise carried out by the club members. Asked why then the students were carrying the logs at night. <laughs> Mudamia insists that whoever sent the video to us was driven by malice, that it could be the work of his detractors who are jealous of the school's achievements. That is malicious. These are definitely when you're in a certain place, you have people who are against you. These logs that the students are carrying, they use as firewood or what was the use for the logs? They were starting from the school farm where they are planted and therefore the school as well. He says he sees nothing wrong as the students do so voluntarily since they planted the trees themselves, nor has he received any complaints from the parents. So that our parents are not complaining, so long that the, the, the officials in the ministry are not complaining, our kids are okay and they are comfortable, then I don't see the whole business about the trying to get control of our school. <laughs> However, this parent whom we talked to in a village neighbor in the school says she had been forced to withdraw her child from the school. The district education officer in charge of Mara District Moses Karate says that he has received the report on the matter and his office is still investigating. According to the Kenyan Constitution, Article 23 bans corporal punishment and Article 53 goes on to state that every child has a right to be protected from abuse, neglect, harmful cultural practices, all forms of violence, inhuman treatment and punishment, and hazardous or exploitative labor. Carol Derifo, KTN in Chogoria, Tarakaniti County. Well, let's stay with matters education and yesterday if you remember KTN ran a story on how mother tongue is used as the language of instruction in rural schools. Tonight Catherine Omwando explores the practical alternatives for the many Kenyan pupils chasing formal education in rural schools. <laughs> just heard is one of the predicaments that come with teaching English to pupils accustomed to their local language by teachers who are not so enthusiastic in teaching what can be considered by most as a foreign language. <laughs> Because Kenya's education system is based on the English language, there is no alternative. As a result, many children across Kenya will continue to mispronounce words and phonetic sounds of the English vocabulary. Many children even use English as a language of instruction at home, but um, in, in several other places, especially in the, in the urban slums, you find that Sheng is, would be actually referred to as the language of the catchment area. So that is a, a big problem. The change is too drastic. But that does not mean you should not instruct in mother tongue. What it means is that you need to invest much more in strengthening English as a second language and ensuring that the teacher is well empowered. The local language in most rural schools is used well beyond the third grade as is policy. Teachers say they have no alternative given the environment. Because we have schools like Adakan with the same in the same category. We have a Memsha, we have Haria. Uh, those schools, you know, they come from town and uh, uh, the language that they use from the house 
to school is mainly English. The reason as to why the performances in rural areas is really poor, first and foremost, is attributed to uh, language issues. How are you going to be able to teach if you do not have teaching and learning materials? How will you be able to teach in mother tongue when teachers are not even prepared in in-service, let, let alone in in-service in, in, in courses? So because of this, therefore, teachers have been left to figure it out for themselves. Schools have been left to figure it out for themselves. Currently, the country has a shortage of at least 50,000 teachers. Most schools, like Akingili Primary School in Nyanza and Kiamwiru Primary School, will have one teacher teaching half of the subjects, if not all, for every class. They, like the pupils and students, lack the necessary materials unlike their counterparts in private or urban schools, and yet they sit the very same national examinations. <laughs> The challenge for educators is bridging the gap between the pupils and teachers in poor rural schools and their counterparts in richer and urban schools. Catherine Omwando, KTN. And now it's time for some business news tonight on KTN Prime. And we are joined by Edith Kimani, who's at our business studio. Edith, good to see you tonight. What do you have for us? Good to see you too, Yvonne. Well, we do have quite a bit prepared for you. We're still talking taxes, but that's not all. Here's what we've prepared for you this evening. Tea firmers decry low bonus payout. End of the road. Fake journalist is arrested as he attempts to talk to Nairobi Senator Mike Sonko. Good evening. Let's get this show on the road. Now, despite tea sector receiving the highest revenues from the sale of tea during the 2012-2013 financial year, tea farmers in the country have termed the payment as below their expectations. Philip Keitani opens the business segment with the, deal, uh, with the details. <laughs> Geoffrey Bet, a tea farmer in Bomet County, goes about his business, but at the back of his mind, he is not settled. He is not happy with his year's tea bonus that he had expected to construct a permanent house. Across the country in Odaya, Peter Washirangatia is another dejected tea farmer. He shares the sentiments of Bet and many other farmers across the country who feels this year's bonus does not mirror their hard work. Najaribu ni fanya kamuladi moja kama ama bili ni wenu ngo beangu dio hata mabaya shai giteremuka. According to the Kenya Tea Development Authority, tea farmers will this year be paid an average of 31 shillings per kilo across its managed factories beginning this October. Our crop production increased by 24% during the period under review to about 1.1 billion uh, green leaf uh, kilos. The fears of farmers from across the country is formed on the basis of the rising cost of farm inputs like fertilizer. But even with the bonus announcement, farmers like Washira are warning those who take the opportunity to marry make instead of reinvesting in their farms. <laughs> For now, tea farmers in the country will have to redouble their efforts to improve their earnings next year, despite KTDA saying returns are historic. Philip Keitan, KTN Business Today. Over 140 billion shillings in pensions fund is at stake in the war of words between Employers Federation, the Workers Union and the government. Now this follows a controversial amendment to the NSSF bill that seeks to lock out workers and employers representatives from the institution's board. Adelaide Changole has the latest. Cabinet Secretary for Labor and Social Protection Kazungu Kambi continues to take the heat over amendments to the NSSF bill. For a bill to have been changed in a clandestine fashion after it's been discussed for three years, to me, raises a lot of issues. Indeed, as employers, we have said we have withdrawn the goodwill that we had advanced towards this bill until the concerns raised by employers have been addressed. Only recently, Kotu Secretary General Francis Atwoli vowed to fight the ministry tooth and nail, claiming the government's intention was to loot pensioners of their hard-earned money. The Federation of Kenya Employers are faced with a big challenge where some unscrupulous business cartels 
are trying to hijack the National Social Security Fund. The minister sought to downplay these allegations, assuring that the motives were in the best interest of the pensioners' fund. The word and the sentence he wanted to be in that article is the most representative trade union, which I'm sure he knows which trade union has the most representatives. In the new draft bill, the cabinet secretary has been given a blank check in appointing the NSSF board. This institutions like KOTU and FKE say will weaken governance structures. Giving a cabinet secretary powers to appoint people willy-nilly without reference to any known institution is in my way is in a way retrogressing and going back to where we came from. This, they add, would give government unchecked access to over 140 billion shillings in pensioners' funds. We suspect that there are people with ill intentions who want to have their hands into this kitty. Adelaide Changole, KTN Business Today. Well, here's a news headline that I'm sure no one likes to see. More taxes ahead. Piling pressure on Kenyans with more taxes could cripple efforts to grow Kenya's economy. At least that's what our, our analysts are arguing. This follows a revelation by the National Treasury that it plans to restructure the income tax and excise duty to raise additional revenue. Michael Karanja explains. In a new twist in their bid to raise revenue, the government is at an advanced stage of restructuring income tax and excise duty, a move that is not likely to sit well with Kenyans, already feeling the VAT pinch that has since seen consumer prices shoot through the roof. We are now embarking on reform, reforming other taxes to ensure that they are in line with our Vision 2030 objectives. Treasury wants to amend the Income Tax Act so as to impose withholding tax on winnings from gaming and betting, as well as adjust the capital gains tax under the income tax to formulate modalities for its effective enforcement. This is all being done as the government looks for ways of raising the 1.6 trillion shillings in the 2013-2014 financial year. But analysts are of the opinion that higher taxation might just be a double-edged sword that kills economic development. Today's borrowing is tomorrow's taxation. Tomorrow has reached. On closer examination, the adjustments on taxation continue to heap pressure on the same Kenyans the government wants to cushion. With 6% growth envisioned in this year, higher taxation might just not incentivize the working population to pull in the same direction. A raise in taxation does not necessarily yield more revenues because a raise in taxation changes the behavior of your city, general citizenry and uh, for, for the higher income earners. Um, a disincentive to produce. So why work harder if they're going to earn less? The government has a tough balancing act of easing off huge borrowing and plugging the budget deficit, but the path chosen through taxation might not be the best alternative. Michael Karanja, KTN Business Today. Well, with that story in mind, here's hoping your money performed as you had expected it. Here's a look at the financial markets review. Well, they do say that in life there are only two certain things, death and taxes. My name is Edith Kimani. I hand you back over to Yvonne Okwara in the News Center. Good evening. Indeed, Edith, that is the truth, death and taxes. Thank you very much for the business news tonight. Now, it was a fun day for the young ones at the Nyumbani Children's Home right here in Nairobi when staff from the Standard Group paid them a visit and shared both time and gifts with the children. Now, as part of the Standard Group's ongoing activities in community work, staff members from the Standard Group spent a good part of the day today with the kids who were just too happy to sidestep their daily routine to engage in fun activities with their visitors. The children got books, food items donated by the company, and its employees.
we depend on donations and uh, our main funding is coming from the US we have a fundraising event in every year in September right now our executive director is there in the US well Nick Budimba is standing by with the day's sports in the sports studio Nick good evening All right. All right, Wilson, thank you very much. And of course, today we've got again lots more of sports news for you, including what FC Leopards will have now to make amends with a new coach in the coming days and also on sports coming up. And also coming up in sports, Kenya on the verge of retaining the Africa feminine volleyball title. One thing I'm not prepared to do. And I will not do. I will not resign. I'll never die. I resign. You're watching KTN Prime. All right, I'm Nicholas Mudimba. Now, time for sports. Kenya made it four out of four in the ongoing Africa Feminine Volleyball Cup of Nations. After beating Cameroon in straight set, despite the victory, the title will be decided tomorrow in Kenya plays Tunisia. Tunisia recorded a third victory following a 3-1 win over Senegal while Egypt registered their first victory in the Six Nations competition. For the 2013 Feminine Africa Cup of Nations reached Fever Pitch Wednesday evening in Kasarani as Kenya registered her fourth match to remain on course to retain the African title it won two years ago. The Central Africans put up a fight of their lives by the hosts won in their usual legal state as they won the opening set 25-22. Kenya, the dominant team in the continent, gave as much as they received in the second set and won 25-20 before locking out their opponents 25-22. A final match to ensure victory. Tunisia is also a good side, but I'm confident as I speak that we are going to beat them. And uh, we want to maintain the same record of 3 0 so that uh, we make it a clean, a clean sweep. We know that uh, uh, all the teams came here wanting to win, but it's so unfortunate that uh, our team is very strong. <laughs> The final match against Tunisia is a must win since Cameroon can turn the tables should they win their final match and Kenya loses. Cameroon had come boasting that they are going to beat us and I'm happy that we beat them 3-0. So for us, it's a big plus. Kenya, who now have 12 points, will face Tunisia Thursday evening. Cameroon plays Algeria, hoping that Kenya may lose to Tunisia as they have nine points. Victor Ugale, KTN Sports. Now, to Matas Rugby, prolific try scorer Colin Sinjera and the 2012-2013 IRB Series captain Andrew Monde will play leadership roles but not fully participate for the Kenyan team during the 18th Safaricom Sevens tournament that bullies off on Friday in Kasarani. Kenya's Shuja, one of the two host teams, will be seeking its eighth overall title. This year's tournament will present coach Felix Uching a chance to pick his team for the opening IRB Series leg in Gold Coast next month. Experienced Colin Sinjera will not be featuring for Kenya's main team, Shuja, during the 18th Safaricom Sevens. Instead, the prolific trust score will be providing leadership in the second team, the Morans. Players who inspired during the 2013 National Sevens Series but could not make it to the Shuja team makes up the second team, the Morans. But eventually, and depending on the individual displays, after the three days of Aganza, some could be drafted into the team that travels to the IRB season opener in Gold Coast, Australia. Technically, you see players in certain positions that will be competing for, for, for selection for the, for the final positions for the training squad. So that basically dictated that. We have also int introduced together with the Kenya Rugby Union uh, an, an academy, which we've started seeing academy players being picked out throughout the tournament. 
Homeboys teammates of Humphrey Mulama, Augustine Lugonzo, Leonard Mugaisi, Chris Asegu of Mombar FC, Tony Unyango from Strathmuleus, and Kevin Keegan from Harlequins will make the international debut. But Biko Adema, Dennis Muhanji, and Horace Utino will be spectators since they were ruled out due to injuries. For the players, their technical ability, their strength, understanding of their roles has played a key role in the selection this year. It's going to be really competitive, so there's no like a particular team you want to, to say is going to be our biggest challenge. The format of this year's tournament changed and will feature 20 teams following the incorporation of the club's category into the main tournament. Felix Totio Cheng will prove his coaching prowess at the Safaricom Sevens and during the Gold Coast Sevens, after which the Kenya Rugby Union will appoint a substantive coach. All true. Even if he was going to be the coach of Kenya, his contract with South Africa rugby lands up to the end of October. The 60,000 seat Kasarani Stadium was preferred as a way of convincing the IRB to include Kenya as the host of one of the IRB legs. All right, now, local coaches are their own enemies, and that could be the reason why FC Lepas, Gurmai, and the larger extent the national team around the stars seem to have faith in foreign coaches. Interim FC Lepas coach James Nandwa, who took the reins of leadership in one of the hottest seats in the Kenyan football, is asking for patience during his tenure as he tries to navigate through the six remaining league matches. KTN senior sports reporter Hassan Juma puts that story into perspective. After the national team coaching seat, the next demanding football coaching job is the two biggest community-based clubs, FC Leopards and Gurmahiam. The three jobs have been the preserve of foreign coaches, but after Belgian Luke Aimel has shown the door in favor of James Nandwa, the former Kenyan international is well aware that it will not be rosy at the Leopards' den. I'm going to work hard because it's a hot seat everywhere. If you don't perform, there's a problem. However, according to Nando, local coaches are to blame for the influx of foreign coaches in Kenya. Nando is of the view that once a local coach shows his worth, an element of envy sets in. <laughs> Nando was unveiled on Wednesday, and as he exchanged pleasantries with his new charges, his employers are asking for patience for the new man at the helm. We know he can deliver. We know he's been in football uh, circles in Kenya for quite some time. With six league matches and the Go TV Cup to go, Nando has not given up hope of clinching the league dead them. Interim coach James Nando was unveiled today and he's asking the fans to be patient as he tries to cobble up a winning outfit. Even for KTN from KTTC, I'm Hassan Juma. KTN Sport. All right, and remember, it's another Champions League night as Arsenal are away in France against Marseille and Chelsea are taking on FC Basel in England. And I'll hand you over to Yvonne and Wilson on the other side of the studio. Well, thank you very much, Nick, for that. And now to our news end tonight. And a 28-year-old man has been arrested in Nairobi for impersonating a journalist who wanted to interview Nairobi Senator Mike Mbuvi Sonko. Marshal Wanyoro Wanjeri had allegedly been tracking Sonko for an unspecified story he claimed was about to expose unless the senator met him. The flamboyant senator says he became suspicious when the man kept sending him text messages in which he identified himself as Kagunda from a media group in Kenya. At one time, the alleged fake journalist called Sonko's wife, explaining that it was important for the senator to give him audience before he publishes the story. Sonko says the name the man gave him was different from the name that appeared in his ID card. KTN Weather. Brought to you by Morting Doom Power Guard. Guard. Nothing kills faster and keeps killing for longer.
Well, we have come to the end of this live newscast, but we will, of course, um, take uh, a look at the percentage for our BQ tonight. And tonight we did ask, do you agree with the ICC prosecution that the trial be conducted in private? Do you agree with the ICC prosecution that the trial be conducted in private? We have the results now. And... 51% of you do not agree with that, while 49% say yes. 51% do not agree, while 49% say yes. Let's take some of the views that have come in via our Twitter and um, our Twitter handles and SMS. Mm -hmm. um, and let's start off with this one. Absolutely 50-50 tonight. Rateng, you say, yes, Kenyans have demonstrated that we're, we're not mature enough to respect laid down laws even when to our benefit. Um, you call yourself African, that's me. You say, no way. Why have the truth in privacy? This is not a bedroom affair. Well, let's take um, a very quick one here from uh, James Durango. And he says, some witnesses may not be sufficiently protected. Private sessions may be held at times, but not always. Indeed, and we leave it at that for tonight. We thank you so much for staying with us on KTN Prime, but don't go too far because KTN Perspective is on right after this. From us, it's goodbye, good night. We'll see you again tomorrow. Enjoy the rest of your viewing. Good night.